four, and I'd like to officially call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Nelson? Here. Lanier? Here. 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 A quorum is present. The first item on the agenda are audience comments. And we have A. Trop. Good evening, and thank you. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Okay, first of all, um, I've been a resident of Flossmoor for numerous years. I grew up here. I want to just Ill alliterate the answers that School District 161 needs strong financial practices, which have a balance of academics, not only sports. And my, my goal is to hope that there is a balance which deals with academics, not just sports. And it's nice, it's very nice to read your, your, how do I say, information on your, your different schools. But some schools just state sports, and Flossmoor was just not founded on sports. There needs to maintain an academic balance of increasing your reading skills and your science skills. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trapp. And it was a pleasure to meet with you today. I'm so sorry, sir. I said it was a pleasure to meet with you today. Please, I didn't hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I have a little tech issue. Uh, the next item on the next item on the agenda is, pardon? Above and beyond. Oh, above and beyond. Thank you. <laughs> above and beyond. Thank you. I'm trying to make this work. All right. So we have one staff member to recognize for our second quarter 2022-2023 above and beyond. Uh, award, and that's Julie Heisman from Serena Hills. Come on up, Julie. <laughs> Julie's nominator could not be here tonight, but she did share a video, so we're going to play that video. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you do. Okay, the next item on the agenda is executive session. May I have a motion to go oh, to executive session for matters relating to personnel 5 ILCS 120-2C1 and matters relating to student discipline 5 ILCS 120-2C9. So moved. Second. Oh, whoops, sorry. 
One more. And, and for matters, bargaining. just hold on. For matters relating to collective bargaining, 5 ILCS 120-2C2. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We will, we're going to executive session.
Um, nope. Whoa. Regu uh, open session, um, op it's, we're <laughs> restarting open session at 7.34. <clears throat> Roll call. Ross. Here. 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 Okay. The next item on the agenda is the community, community report. Absolutely. Community Just engagement. Mm -hmm. Yes. The next item on the agenda is the community engagement committee report. Absolutely. Uh, we had a meeting at the end of January. We spent most of our time focused on the end of the year activities, making sure that our, our schedule was set, and then a good amount of time kind of talking through the focus of our community engagement survey. So we'll have those, uh, a draft of that ready to go for our next board meeting. We can get that approved at the end of March. This is right on time. We wanted to create some space between that survey and the five essentials survey. So we're kind of right on track with that. As I said, we'll bring that back to the board in March for review, discussion, kind of pick the part, questions apart, add questions, et cetera and then get that approved out and then have a date to bring it back to the board. Hey, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Absolutely, we'll welcome everybody, uh, not only those in person, but those streaming our meeting at home. Quite a bit has happened since our last meeting, so I wanna take a moment as we're giving the updates uh, to congratulate our students, uh, our eighth grade boys basketball team. Uh, congratulations to them for not only winning sectionals, but regionals as well, and they punched their ticket to the state basketball tournament. Unfortunately, they did lose their first round game, but that certainly didn't tarnish their excellent season. Congratulations, not only to the scholars, uh, but also their coaches, Mr. Wright and Ms. Erlinson. And then also since our last meeting, we did host our diversity dinner on Thursday, February 9th. We welcomed parents, community members, staff members, et cetera, for a discussion on such topics as diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in District 161. The table conversations were engaging, and I personally benefited from connecting uh, and hearing the perspectives uh, and experiences within our community. I thought the conversations were robust. I thought they were authentic, and I, I certainly took a lot from that experience. We'll schedule our next event in February of 2024, and we'll be looking forward to that as well. As a reminder, Dieta Jones was our uh, keynote speaker for that evening, and she worked with our teachers at our Institute Day on February 10th as well. I will tell you the, the feedback that I received from that Institute Day was probably the best, probably the best that I've received in our, my career, just on random teachers reaching out to say, this was incredibly valuable. These are the types of conversations we, we should be having. Kudos to Amabel and her team for organizing everything and uh, working with Dieta to create such a valuable day. Uh, we had Dieta Jones, we also had Facing History, and we'll continue that work into next year as well. And then as a final reminder, on March 1st, we're hosting a limited ticket event for a parent university with Julie lithcott Hames, who is a New York Times best-selling author for her book titled How to Raise an Adult, uh, Break Free of the Overparenting Trap and Prepare Your Child for Success. We're hosting the event on Wednesday, March 1st at 6.30 p.m. at Parker Junior High, and this is valuable information for all of our families, no matter who you are or what you are. Her book has actionable recommendations for all parents. I, I strongly encourage everyone here to take advantage of that. We continue to promote the event, but we are limited on space in the Parker Gym. So uh, parents here or community members, et cetera, if you'd like to participate, please sign up as soon as possible and we'll reserve a spot. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Question. Of course. Um, am I recognized? Yeah, okay. question. So um, thank you for the report and I wanted to speak more about the Dieta, um, I feel like it's a Jones last mm -hmm. Jones. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Dieta Jones. Um, I had an opportunity to, to participate in that. And there were two things that I guess I, I'd like to know whether we can um, do. And one, I thought it was, it was, it was useful, but mm -hmm. it, it, how can I put this? And the amount of time that we had, there was so, it was like we, we just touched it. Mm -hmm opened it, but we really couldn't get, all through the time restrictions, sure. we really couldn't get deeper into it. So I appreciate how you reported that was a good thing, sure. but I don't know what the next steps are for the people that attended. Mm -hmm. um, so the second thing that I also um, wanted to touch on regarding that was that um, 
because not only did I find it useful, but I also heard that there were many other people who said that had they known about it, that they would have attended. And so it gets back to the age old question of how are we communicating about opportunities you know, to involve parents sure. you know, to, to attend things like that. And I don't have, yeah. and I know it's something that the board continues to bring and ask, but again, that's one of the things that appears to still be an issue that we have to continue to, uh, to try to wrestle with. Sure. Well, as far as next steps, we'll continue those conversations, certainly. Um, you know, we still have space on our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee for people to join if they're so interested in that. You know, as far as advertising, I mean, I, I know that we, we've sent this out multiple times on its own individual flyer. We advertised on social media. We advertised in building level newsletters. It went out to all uh, District 161 boundary residents. We, we will continue to look. I know that I spoke with some people who said, oh, I forgot to RSVP, but I'm just not going to make it, right? Um, so we are open to any and all ideas to how to share the information um, and, and get it out there. So if, you know, we can either follow up offline or if there's a community member who missed it, maybe I can follow up with them to find out, okay, we sent it out to these four places. You fall, fell right in between this gap so we can fill that. So if maybe you can share that. Thank you, David. It wasn't recorded, right? No, correct. Yeah. We did not record. I think that's part of the challenge, is just scheduling. And it's a high value event. Sure. Yeah. I think a lot of people would like to be there, but just can't. Yeah. Is, is recording a possibility? <coughs> recording is always a possibility. Those are tough, especially when you're dealing with sensitive issues and people being willing to have those conversations on camera. <laughs> that would exist in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. um, people being afraid to say the wrong thing, potentially. Yeah, I guess to Cam's point though, it, maybe not on that, but when it comes to the opportunity to communicate or make information available and <laughs> all, all about the bigger picture communication, mm -hmm. maybe we should, if, for those things where recordings are possible, maybe we try to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including personnel report 23-011, payroll for the month of January, the 2023-24 board meeting dates, board of education and executive session meeting minutes, the FOIA requests, and the disposal of the piano at Western Avenue School. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Oh, sorry, question? <laughs> Um, regarding the um, board meeting date, um, is there going to be thought given to possibly scheduling reg regular scheduled dates for the committees? I saw that was mentioned, and I was wondering, is that something? We can add the committees to this, certainly. Okay. I, I think yeah, that of would course. be good to actually add that so that we can yeah. kind of see when the committees are scheduled to meet. Certainly. Um, whether it be monthly, quarterly, or, or whatever. Um, my second question was regarding the disposal of the equipment. Um, I understand that we, we not only the piano at Western is about to go ahead and lose his home, um, but others have lost their homes. Um, I just want to make sure, so the, 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 teachers, the music teachers that are preparing with the students to, to, to instruct them, are they still, they still have something to work with? Gone. Yes. I'm old school, so that I have a piano. Go yep, they do. Okay. They do. They have keyboards. That was it. Thank you. Mm, of course. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 The motion passes. Next item on the agenda uh, will be the discussion items. The first item is the 2022 financial audit report. <laughs> Good evening. Um, audit 2022 is finally done. <laughs> Kelly Kirkman from RSM is here to kind of give you the brief rundown of what she did and her team did. Yep. Thanks, Fran. Um, good evening, everyone. As Fran said, my name is Kelly Kirkman. I am an audit partner with RSM, and I was part of the, the team who you know, worked on the 2022 audit. So really wasn't planning on going into much financial information. It's a little bit you know, dated now, being June 30th. I know 
Fran and Carrie probably do an excellent job yeah. with. Could you, know, you hold on just one are. moment? Oh. Oh yeah. Sorry. So wasn't really going to go into too much financial information. I'm sure you guys are getting you know those those kind of updates from from your team um, at monthly meetings. But overall, just wanted to give you an update on the audit. You know everything was done and filed with ISBE. The, um, I'm, I believe that Fran gave you the PDFs of the financial report, a single audit report, and a report to the board. So really just wanted to point out in the financial report that um, it is an unmodified opinion. So it's a clean opinion. It's the best one you can get. I mean, if you're comparing it from this year to last year, the format of the opinion this year is a little bit different just because it you know goes into a little bit more detail on the responsibilities of management versus the auditors. but. Overall, a clean opinion, the best one that you can get, and you know, consistent with all, all prior years. Um, you know, wanted to point out that your ISBE AFR financial profile was a 4.0. So again, that is the highest, you know, the, the highest score you can get with that as well. And then lastly, with the single audit, so the district in 2022 had about three and a half million dollars of federal funding. So of that, we you know, really dig into the child nutrition cluster and then also the educational stabilization fund. And really, that's a lot of detailed testing, looking at controls, looking at compliance, and um, you know, overall, no compliance findings, no control issues. So you know, the, the audit over the federal funds was a clean one as well. So. Thank you. Any questions? Thank right, you. Thank you. This is truly a credit to not only Fran, uh, in her work, but Carrie Raven is here as well. Um, you know, Emily, Nancy in that office, they take this work very seriously. And I'm just you know, very, I know that we're all very grateful. Um, but this is one of the few times that we do get to pat Fran on the back and, and really uh, kind of lean into her expertise and her professionalism. So Fran, thank you. Thanks, Fran. Thank you, thank you Fran. <laughs> My you pleasure. should stay up here and tell us more. <laughs> next item on the agenda. You know agenda. what? I think I will. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the construction manager versus general contractor for long range planning, long range facility plan. Okay. So as we start getting into all of the potential work that we're going to do over the next four years, um, one of the big things that comes up is how are we going to do this work and with what kind of a structure are we going to plan for getting all this work done? Which brings us to the discussion over hiring a construction manager versus a general contractor. And there are very specific um, things that you know one does and the other does. They, they will get generally the same work done, but in a different manner. So we've asked Wold, we've asked Mike to come and kind of give a presentation on, on the difference between the two. I did also give you guys a, um, an article in, in your packets, if, if you did go through it, to give you kind of an idea um, of what the decision, you know, the, different, the differences are between the two. So Mike's gonna talk about that a little bit, and then we can discuss whether you guys wanna bid as a general contractor or whether you wanna go out for a request for qualifications for a construction manager. So Mike, take it over. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Fran. Um, so I'm just going to walk through um, the really to compare um, construction management with general contracting and talk about what the benefits of construction management and developing that relationship. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, so here's a general diagram of the relationship of uh, the school district who um, has a need for a project. Uh, the architect who designs the project and works and is contracted directly with the school district. And you can see there the different uh, types of work and designs that the architect does, MEP, interior design, security, uh, technology. And then you also see on the left there, contractor. So in the public realm, you uh, take the designs and you bid those out uh, publicly. So you have no control over the, the company that is bidding, um, their qualifications, who, their, who, your, who the staff are, who their site superintendents are. And in general, the general contractor is loyal to their subcontractors uh, versus um, the relationship or the, the, uh, the general administration to the, the school district. So that's, that's kind of a diagram. Um, the construction manager is similar in the sense that, um, but quite different. So the architect um, 
is, again, focused on the design intent. However, the construction manager is also part of that process very early on. Yeah, so there you'll see, okay. Is, on, is part of the process earlier on. That really is the differentiator there. Uh, also, um, the construction manager holds the risk on all prime contracts. So the school district hires the construction manager directly. You will, part of this process that I'll outline later is you get qualifications from the construction management companies. You ask um, you know, what their fees are up front, who is gonna be on the team, what their approach is, what their history is, and what their, again, you could, what their background is. That's really, you're hiring them for their direct qualifications. And the contract that you have is with them, and then those subcontractors are bid out separately in the public realm, okay? Whereas general contracting, you don't know what the, um, who the subs are, what their bids are until much later. It's, and you have no uh, control over that. So here's a, um, just a comparison side by side. Uh, so on the right there, I mentioned the district chooses the construction management company and their people to partner with. And that's key because you wanna start to develop that long-term relationship, much like you've developed the relationship with Wold Architects, you begin to develop that relationship with the construction management company. So you know the people every day, they're coming to regular meetings with you very early on. Um, and whereas a general contractor is selected based on solely on cost or lump sum bid, and you have no control over who, who you're getting, really, um, unless they're um, uh, not a non-responsive bidder. Um, on the right there, um, the CM provides cost estimates, logistic planning, and design input at all phases. So again, if you have complex projects, you want that person on board to talk about how are we gonna phase these projects? How can we package um, the different trades? Uh, really looking at your district holistically, uh, providing uh, cost estimates that are uh, in line with the bids that they're seeing every week that are coming in. And they work closely with the architect too, so we bring our expertise at cost estimating. We can make design changes based on their input as well. Um, so it's really that partnership. Um, whereas there is no outside design input from a uh, general contractor. A uh, construction manager works side by side with the architect uh, for con uh, contract administration during construction. A general contractor um, is administered directly uh, with the owner and uh, it's, you know, you really have no, um, you don't have any partnership there. Uh, the CM publicly bids all work in, as an independent trade. So on bid day, you'll have a stack of you know, all trades. So you'll have an HVAC trade. So you'll have five or you know, three to five HVAC contractors. And you'll see all their bids, and then you pick the lowest bidder. Electrical, um, general trades, you know, the whole list there that I showed earlier. You would see all those, and then you would go through and select the lowest bidder. You would make sure that they're you know, vetted and um, that they've met all qualifications. Um, if there's any reason for the district to believe they're non-responsive, you can then challenge that. Um, so again, it's a much more transparent process. And also the construction manager holds risk for trade performance. So there, sometimes you've heard the word at risk, general uh, construction manager at risk, that's what that's referring to. And also there's open book cost with established budget contingencies and allowances. So you know what the bid is for uh, the subs. You know what the construction management fees are. They charge a specific fee for their management, for their site superintendents, all the folks that are on you know, the job site, um, processing all the shop drawings. You know all those people, you're paying them, really you're paying them, uh, the construction manager, for their people in the office. I mean, all that is all transparent, whereas with the general contractor, the general contractor is trying to reduce all that so they can keep all of the, um, the additional contingencies. And the contingencies would go back to the owner at the end of the project. Okay. 
So in, in summary, the construction management um, team, will, uh, the overall team and the owner and the architect have a better understanding of the project costs prior to bidding. So you really have that, really go in with almost knowing what the bids are gonna be. They also are bringing that construction experience really from the beginning at all phases. You know, for example, if they know that steel, certain types of steel uh, prices have gone up that week, then we can change the design and readjust so that we can still get the, the same budget, still keep it on budget. They also bring the experience with logistics, site, safety, site safety, and planning. Okay, so what's the process for elect, selecting a construction manager? Uh, today you're gonna have a discussion, you know, answer any questions, I'll answer any questions. March 13th you would approve to proceed with the RFQ. There is a standard RFQ form that the Illinois Association of School Business Officials has, and we can customize that for the you know, the stipulations of how you're going to ask for fees, um, really can customize it to meet your um, needs. Uh, we'll accept the submissions in April, shortlist the companies, uh, interview them based on, again, based on their qualifications, and then present this short list or, you know, the final list, final person, final company to the Board of Education on May 8th. And May 22nd, you would approve um, that company to move forward, and then we would move into contract at that point. Okay, is there any questions? Open it up. I know I kind of went through a lot there, but um, construction management is, is fairly typical in the K-12 market um, because of that partnership, because of you're doing a lot of work over the summertime. Um, and so, uh, this is really where it came up, Fran. Yeah, so I think part of the thing is, you know, the last couple of times that we've done major projects, yeah. we've come down to having conversations about who the lowest bidder was on a general contract. And I don't think we were thrilled with the companies that we were dealing with for the last two, well, not the last ones, but the prior two on um, work. This gives us the ability, yeah, this gives us the ability to at least have, a lot of these construction managers are also general contractors. They do both. So for example, the last job that we did was with Henry Brothers, which we had no problems with that work. They were wonderful to work with. They are also construction managers. They will be presenting an RFQ. I've already spoken to my uh, Mark Deneau over there. Actually, he's been like, when are you guys going? When are you doing? What are you doing? Um, I think, you know, they would bid on whether it be a general contractor or a construction manager. They see the benefit of a construction management type of contract with us, especially with work over the four years. I'd love to be able to take a look at what work we have, you know, planned and, you know, what they could do to help, um, you know, which projects are done at what time to make sure you have the right trades on at the same time and those kinds of things. Um, I spoke to several school districts who have gone this route. Um, they've gotten a lot of response on RFQs. Um, I know Aero Special Ed Co-op that just renovated um, what used to be um, Queen of Peace High School and is now the Speed, or I'm sorry, the Aero Cooperative Building. Uh, they had 11 uh, contract managers come in and, and submit a, a, ref a request for qualifications. Um, it enables us to really figure out who we want to be working with as opposed to who just comes in with a low bid and we can't even trust it. So that to me is the big plus in, in going this model versus the way we've gone in prior. It's not like we're not going to be bidding the actual cost of the work. We're still going to be bidding just with the individual trades. It's just the, the oversight that will have a little more control over who we're dealing with as opposed to who comes in with the lowest number. Questions? Any general ideal in terms of a cost comparison when you use a construction manager or just a general contractor? Does one tend to be more expensive than the other? Or uh, at the end of the day, the general con, it, it's somewhat of a wash. I mean, you're paying a little bit of a premium for that 
pre-construction phase where they're partnering with you. Um, but at the end of the day, the companies, you know, you have site superintendents that they both have to pay over ahead and profit. So where one is built, is sort of baked into the bid, the general contractor, all that is baked in. The construction manager, you're seeing all those fees. You're seeing that, that enumerated, um, you know, in front of you. So no, not one or the other is not necessarily saving or more expensive. It really just depends on. Um, it's, it's. Yeah, go ahead. It's going to be hard to say specifically, well, if I had gone this way, it would have been this much, and I went this way, it was that much, because you either choose one or the other. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I will say, speaking to the business officials who have gone both ways, they didn't feel like construction management cost them any more, but it, they felt like it gave them a little more um, control over the project and um, feeling better about the people that they were working with other than the, I was just thrown into this contractor. So my question is this, and, and first I'll, I'll make a statement. I, I do definitely prefer the construction manager because it gives you a, a, basically a filter between the GC, the contractor, and, and, and you, the person hiring. Um, my question is, how do you feel that we'll be able to control the time element? Because sometimes the construction manager actually can uh, how can I put it? Um, create more time because they're they're trying to negotiate. They're trying to get either the materials or they're trying to get more late, or whatever it is, and that can become a little more problematic. Whereas with the GM, again, because there's a direct, con direct contract with them, typically there is a little bit smoother flow. Second question: um, When it comes to the cost, um, because we're so concerned about the overall budget of this item. Um, do you forecast that the construction manager, and I'm hoping that they, I think I know what the answer is, can uh, try to bring it in on budget um, or under budget, ahead of schedule? I mean, what the whole expectations? What's realistic? Just to address the, the cost issue, the with the early involvement and the sort of the pulse that they have on the bid market and the subcontractors that they've developed strong you know, relationships with, those numbers are gonna come forward a lot sooner. So if the numbers are higher, right, then we have to adjust the design to bring the budget back in line. So that's really that checks and balances at the earlier phase. Um, and same thing with the schedule, that you're, kind of, you're getting ahead of it. You're scheduling the exact week when things are supposed to be delivered, and it's all laid out there by the construction manager. The general contractor, you don't see that ahead of time. So it's that, again, getting ahead of it, planning ahead, that's really the benefit of that. Um, a lot of the con construction manager are specializes in doing those uh, complex phase summer work. You know, it's now it's, you know, it's down to, you know, eight, 10 weeks now, you know, that summer window. Um, also, with lead times, um, getting those, and we're going to talk, we're doing that now, right, I run on through the Omnia, um, but same thing, they're going to help get ahead of that as well with their relationships with the, um, with the companies that supply the, supply the materials for the lead times. So it, it, it's, it's those facets, so it's the early budget, the early scheduling, and getting heads up on any long lead times of equipment or materials. Is that oh, help? Thank you. No, okay, yeah, I, I, I know that there's a couple of components there you had. Anything else? Otherwise, we thank are you. going to bring this back for your approval next time around, um, and we will then get cracking on starting a request for qualifications. And then if anybody wants to be a part of interviewing, they can call Dr. Smith. <laughs> Get you right, right on the list. <clears throat> Thank you. The next item on the agenda, let's see, item C, rooftop unit equipment purchase. Yep. Um, so as we talked about, we're purchasing the equipment through a cooperative. 
uh, cooperative is called Omnia. Um, so all of the equipment's already been bid out. What then Wold Engineers did was kind of get the specs for the, the um, equipment that we would need and then figured out what Omnia had out there and what the cost would be. Really three, we had three um, companies that had, um, that manufactured these, these units, Train York and Daikin. Daikin was so incredibly high and such long lead times that they were immediately cut out. So that really puts you between Train and York. So Train's gonna cost you a little bit more money. Now remember, when we did the budget on this, the estimates, um, Wold had come up, they figured it would cost us about $97,000 for the rooftop units themselves. Um, so York is the lowest price at eight, about $80,600, but they have a lead time of 30 weeks and their warranty is only one year and only part. Then you have train. Their price is a little higher. They're at $94,600. Um, so it's still under what we had budgeted. Their lead time is about 27 to 29 weeks and we understand that number is coming down. So it's getting closer, it's getting shorter rather than longer. Um, additionally, their warranties were one year of parts and labor and then an additional three years of parts. Uh, couple that with the fact that we have train equipment here, so Scotty's crew already know how, you know, have been working on that equipment um, and they've been maintaining that equipment so they have some experience with it. Um, so right now we're going to, we're going to ask you to move this to an action item tonight. You'll also see it in action below so that we can get this ordered because of the lead times. Um, the administration's recommendation is to go with train, um, mostly for the, the lead time as well as the warranty. Um, and of course the, the, that Scotty's crew knows how to, to maintain this equipment already. Generally lowest bid is what we go with. Why are we allowed to do not the lowest bid here? Because they've all been bid through Omnia. Okay. So you can look at other factors then including warranties and, and, and experience with equipment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a little bit, let me not say it. I'm aware of the differences between Train and York and when it comes to a $14,000 difference um, and the, the units are similar, and when there's a one-week difference um, between the expected delivery times, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat with Christina on this. I definitely would see that there's not much of a trade-off between York and Train. Um, so, I mean, I appreciate the administration. Yeah, I mean, and it's the warranties, really, that kind of pushed us. Yeah, so, um, you know, again, I'm just putting out there right, right now, I'm in favor. And when I look at the budget and $14,000, if I compare that to um, how much, like you said, it was estimated, which $17,000 difference, if I do that times three, uh, times four units. No, 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 that's total. That's total equipment. That's not each. Right. It's total. So, I, I, again, it's a sub substantial number. It's a big number. The 14. Correct. Yeah, because it's not over the individual units. That's Correct. all in. Okay, that's just that's making sure you understand. Number. It's yeah, all in. Okay. It's a relative number. I mean, uh -huh. un unfortunately not. <clears throat> but we, I'll, I'll follow up with you after on the, okay. afterwards on this. Um, this project is somewhere $630,000 mm -hmm. total. So the fact that we can still get the train equipment underneath the initial budget price. The one thing that uh, Fran has not leaned into is our controls, right? As being a small district, one, one of our challenges is automated controls. Typical, if you see new construction, all this can be done remotely. We have had a number of challenges, and Scott may want to talk about this, integrating our current HVAC, whether it's boilers or, or chillers, into our control system so that we can monitor those remotely. Meaning, sitting at home on December 13th, it's negative 25 out. We've run into issues with different equipment not showing up in the system. Unit vents begin to freeze and now we've got a major insurance issue, right? So I understand the difference in the cost. Our thinking kind of going through this is it, we, are, we will 
paid just under what we budgeted, but the alignment, not only being able to repair the items, but being able to have a more efficient remote management of them makes it worth it. Scott, did you want to? Yeah, and just uh, better control also, right? So I have more parameters that control the amount of time that I spend on it. I'm sorry. Um, just controlling the unit. So I'll be able to have more parameters to be able to control, as Dana said, when I'm at home on December 13th, <laughs> whatever it was, yeah. Um, that's, that's a big factor uh, for us. I could um, adjust the temperature uh, for a uh, lunch versus gym versus uh, an event after school, which, believe it or not, uh, are, are, there's a lot of differences there. So, um, so are you saying that New York units don't have RTUs? No, the York is a, no, they, it, it is an RTU. It, it, is. Would, it would be similar to having a school bus fleet with some Chevrolets and some Fords. And some of those things will talk and some of them won't. Ideally, you want to have a consistent process so that you can use one item in one and one item in the other and there, there's com some compatibility, but also on the back end side where our computers sit that control them remotely, it's one interface and not multiple to control. And, and Fran, you're saying that the warranty is two years longer with train than with York, correct? Cor actually, I think it's three. Three years, three years more. Okay. Three years on parts. And, and the time for a train could go, we, it, we could get it sooner. It correct. could be more than a week. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is the Flossmore Hills building envelope. Okay, I'm gonna probably have Mike come up here a little too and help me off on this one. Um, we did have a study done by Can-Am um, to look at the envelope at Flossmore Hills and Western Avenue. As you'll recall, especially at Flossmore Hills, um, we've been having a major humidity problem in that building when um, when it's warm out, we're running the air conditioning. Um, and we're just really not able to get that under control with anything that we did over the summer um, to the point that floors were slick, um, people were falling. Um, we had a lot of mold issues in mm -hmm. classrooms. You know, they were starting just surface mold. Um, we had, you know, dripping pipes from condensation. It, it, it was just a mess. Um, and so we had this study done to figure out what the issues were. So I'm going to turn that over to Mike. Yeah, so the study uh, which was done uh, looked at the really forensically at the building very closely, um, mostly above the ceiling, uh, along the exterior wall, areas that you can't see, um, that really uh, with sort of smoke tests and very detailed examinations um, became apparent at that time that uh, airflow was excessive and there was a lot of leakage uh, in that area uh, that's uh, unforeseen really when we started the project originally. So with that, the next steps are to insulate that, to seal the gaps, and that will really bring about um, a good uh, air sealage around those areas. And, um, make a significant dent in improving the air quality and reducing that humid air that in the summertime you can imagine, it's like leaving a, a door open in your house or something that the humid air comes in and really the air conditioner can't keep up with it. So that's what we're recommending. Um, that could be done, that work could be done um, after hours, it could be done on the weekend, it could be done over spring break, and really we'd like to move that forward as soon as possible. So. I, um, I'm looking at that, you know, the price tag on this, and I, this, so this is stemming from when Flossmoor Hills had their air conditioning put in now two summers ago, is that right? Correct. Okay. So in the uh, contractor's um, walkthrough of all of, of specifically Flossmoor Hills and Heather Hill and even Western, and they were planning this out, this was definitely something that, that couldn't have been foreseen. Because um, if, if I was imagining this building, per se, and I was going and I was looking, and if I was well-versed in, in my craft, which I am not, 
my husband might stand up here and say we own a company. So um, I feel like this is something that could have been planned for and avoided. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know. I, w this has to be done regardless, right? We have to fix the problem. But Correct, I just feel yeah. like, uh, is this like, now we're beating ourselves because it's like, oh, we, we could have done this. This could have been accounted for when the work was being done type of thing. That's I'm just looking back. Yeah, I understand. Uh, no, it could not because number one, the project was to install air conditioning. Okay. It was not to do a forensic detailed examination of your exterior wall. And it's possible that this problem existed before, correct? The, the wall that was there, or the component, had been there since it was done, right. you know, was remodeled okay. X number of years be, ago. It may be that where the symptoms were, I'm sorry, it may be that where the symptoms we're seeing are just more obvious now that we have brand new AC units. Correct. The okay. air flowage, if you will you wouldn't have seen that prior anyways. Okay. It was when after the air conditioner was installed that the pressure of the building was bringing in that humid air. And this is one component of a, a kind of a, th a pronged approach to resolving the humidity issue. This is one prong. The other prong is a adjusting the, um, the exhaust fans to connect to the uh, building automation system. And then after this is done, to look at balancing out the whole system once those are sealed up. So those are the multi-prong approach. Who would do that work? Pardon? So that's not part of the 37,000? The balancing would happen after um, the 37,000, yeah. Who would do that? Oh, uh, we can get a, uh, could be done by the, uh, the contractor that's been working with the district. There's a relationship um, with one company. And, um, but that would be done. You'd have to do that after, not now. So the, the short version of this is that the expert's assessment of the building is that the building is under negative pressure. It's drawing air into it. Correct. Right. In other words, the, the building sucks. <laughs> it's holy. We're waiting all weekend to make that joke. <laughs> um, and so we're going to seal it up, but we're still have the negative pressure problem will be addressed at a later date on the balancing side. The negative pressure, you want the building to be under positive pressure. Right. And that's where adjusting the exhaust fan and balancing out will kind of push the air out versus sucking it in. So we've, we've got similar projects at, well, a different focus, but, but at Western Avenue, for example, somewhere on our long range plan, it's about replacing a number of those exterior doors, okay? So as you walk up to them, you can see underneath, you can see between, you can see by the side. Once we replace those, we will need to rebalance Western Avenue because it will be sealed differently than it is now, if that makes sense. Well, and, and now the part that gets to my question. Um, I saw that they actually did the test at, uh, at Western and at Flossmore Hills, and that's how they identified the Correct. Um, seeping underneath, and, the, and, and so I, I get that. Did we not? Was there no need to do it at the other um, three schools, Parker, um, Heather Hill, and Serena? Correct. No, I mean, right now there's no, uh, you know, no immediate humidity issue at those that buildings. Back to you. That's oh. That's what Christina was saying. So, do, so we do have to put the unit in first to find out that the, 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 the building sucks. <laughs> then we come back. How do we? Well, they're yeah, well, the, they're, they're, already they're already air conditioned. It's the whole air conditioning. Uh, project, those would have already been done. So those, so those are operating optimally and efficiently? Correct. I mean, they're providing air conditioning, you know, with balanced approach and you no know, apparent yeah, not humidity that, not issues. That we don't, we've certainly had humidity issues, not like this though. I mean, this, these floors were wet. Um, certainly the ACs couldn't keep up. Ceiling tiles, we ended up removing ceiling tiles. Correct from almost one side of the whole building. So whereas we may have a one-off at a classroom at Parker or you know, even at Western Avenue, we, we didn't have the issues like we did here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to, to oh, sure. the correction. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that this, this isn't something that oh, yeah. I actually have not looked at district-wide. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Absolutely. Is it possible to automate the building envelope to the sense that, that, that it's monitoring the static pressure and, and adjusting the fans in real time, mm -hmm. or is that? As far as like the the, posit the, the yeah. pressurization, I think that's where the balancing comes in. Um, there is a building automation system um, that 
checks like the CO2 level and the, how much outside air. Um, and I think it's just balance. Yeah, it's a balance. Yeah, there is a, a, met, a metric that adjusts for that. And you have Scott. <laughs> I, yeah, so some control of that. We, uh, it's not, we can't fully automate it. Um, things happen in the building. Uh, the doors open so, to let the kids out for recess and back in. Those doors stay open. That changes the building pressure. That balloon b deflates, mm -hmm. right? So uh, our answer to that is going to get our exhaust fans under control on our automation system to get to that point. Okay. But as far as like, a complete system where we can control every single classroom unit event uh, in, in the building, you know, where the, these are going to ramp up, those are going to ramp down. We don't, have that, we don't have that control. We have set the RPMs, reset the RPMs of each unit event, um, but really we got to get the exhaust fans under control because all I could do now is have them all on or all off. Okay. And having them all on is making the building more negative. Right? We're sucking in more air, as, as you say. So we want to prevent that. So we want to get to either neutral or slightly positive where we're pushing just a little bit of air out. And, and Scott, are yeah. all the doors at the other schools, gaskets, all of that, are they all up to, up to snuff and don't need to be replaced? What, what's the, what are we with those? But they're in good shape. Um, we have to constantly check them. They get beat up as, you know, the seasons change. and. Um, yeah, they're, metal, they're you know metal sweeps at the bottom. They we salt, you know, it, it, now in the winter time. So that that takes its toll on those. So we have to keep up with those. But yes, they're in good shape. Um, it, it, buildings have different construction. Western Flossmoor Hills has a different construction than Western Avenue does, right? Uh, which is slightly different than Serena, or even different than Normandy here. So we kind of have to take each one, you know, as as they are. Uh, different contractors have worked on them over the years. Uh, so we have to, you know, kind of follow up with that, and this is the process. So if you look at the uh, long-range facility plan, you're going to see a lot of door replacements and so on that didn't work for years. So, I mean, that's part of what we've already identified as some building yeah. needing this work. And, Fran, we don't have to competitively bid this contract? This, are, no, because actually this... Um, Yep. <coughs> I see. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the mid-year financial report and five-year projections. There it is. Okay, now my stuff. All right. Okay, let's talk about this year. Um, fiscal year 2023, so the one we're in right now. These are numbers as of the end of January, okay? And we're gonna just kind of look at pictures. Bottom line, this is your revenue side. Um, your Total year-to-date revenues compared to budget are pretty much right on. We finally got all of the second installment of the 2021 taxes in right now. Based on what we budgeted and what we have received, we are about $100,000 down. I'm thrilled with that number, okay? Um, we were supposed to have taxes due March 1st. If you haven't heard, they've been pushed off by the county again, so it'll now be an April 1st. So at least that's not quite as bad as January when we're supposed to be in October. So, you know, we'll, we'll take that. Um, state revenues are pretty much right on board where they're supposed to be. Um, local sources, again, about the same thing. So we're, we're really right on track with revenues. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this number. I'm um, on your expenditure side. We're running again right about where we would expect to be. 
Um, we are anticipating coming in a light little underneath budget right now, which you know that's kind of the way I roll. I, I like to, my revenues to come in a little higher and my expenditures to come in a little lower. We give ourselves some breathing room during the year. Um, no great surprise there, but we are pretty well right on, on track with all the expenditures as well. Um, so that's easy. Now, what you're looking at here is the red dotted line is last year's fund balances and the blue line is this year's fund balances so if you get to january that's actual that's right where we are right now um so you can see from the red dotted line you can see we received property taxes in october last year because you see that little dotted line going all the way up and you see this year that blue line took a tank because we didn't start receiving any of the property taxes until december and that going up and then January they crossed because again we received the majority of our funds in uh, December and January. Um, if you look at the model going forward, what it's projecting, as you can see them pretty well running like parallel to each other, expect that to change because again that red line in March, that's when you see that big spike up, that's when we would have received the first installment of, of the next year's taxes. We won't see that in March because they're not due now until April, so expect those lines to cross again when we get to the end of the year, but they should end about where they are, if you can see right now, the red line and the blue line are landing pretty much right on top of each other, which would indicate a balanced year, okay? Um, again, this is kind of a, a wrap up of what the model, so what the model does is it takes our last five years and it averages when we receive monies in and when we take monies out and it projects based on our prior experience over five years, it gives it a kind of an averaging. Um, it is anticipating right now unfavorable revenues, again, mostly coming from that local property taxes, and I think the model is skewing because of the timeline that has just been totally thrown off this year due to the county's issues. Um, and on the um, expenditure side, right now it's looking at coming in at about half a million dollars to the favorable amount, so we should be in good shape. Now the fun part, five-year projections. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So the five-year projections are done based on assumptions. Um, I start with this year's budget, and then I add assumptions to the model moving forward. So on the revenue side, um, we are assuming because the 2022 levy was at 5%, 2023 we know the CPI will be 5% because that was already determined in January. So when we come to do the levy in 2000, uh, December this year, it'll also be a 5% cap. Um, we have estimated a 3% CPI thereafter. Okay. Um, uh, we have two property abatements out there. Um, the first one we're going to make permanent, so that'll be a permanent uh, reduction of taxes. The second one, right now, our, our plan is to recapture those monies, but not until the 2024 levy. Could you speak a little louder, please? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, then the, last, uh, the next piece is your evidence-based funding. So again, we have um, the property tax uh, relief grants are made permanent. Um, which means that the two grants will become part of your base funding minimum. Additionally, we're going to have um, additional about $220,000 added annually for the tier money. So every year, your base funding minimum goes up by what the state uh, agrees to fund in the tiers. We are now a tier one school, so we'll get the lion's share of the increases year over year, which is estimated at about $220,000 a year. Um, we will eliminate all ESSER funds as of uh, fiscal year 2024. Um, so you won't, you'll see the federal dollars come down in the model. And um, on uh, the other state monies, we're looking at uh, transportation claim increasing at about $100,000 a year just due to cost. So that's kind of what it looks like in numbers. Um, you know, it, it's just... It's all of those numbers that I was talking about going. So your, your revenues are increasing at a modest amount, um, but remembering that your federal monies are coming down, so it looks like an actual decrease, okay? On the expenditure side, your 
Salaries for next year are increasing about 4.28 for certified staff and a range of three and a half to four and a half for classified staff, and that's all based on the collective bargaining agreement. Um, the percentages were not same across the board for every, um, every um, personnel types, so we just kind of went by what, what the agreement is. Um, moving forward then, we put in an estimate of 5% increases in salaries for 2025. 4% for 2026 and 2027, and 35 for 2028. Um, in 2025, there is a reduction of nine FTEs because those, those positions are being funded by ESSER. So we've talked about those before, mass specialists, et cetera. So there are nine positions that is funded by federal funds. We will reduce all nine. Um, Benefits, the assumptions are we did an increase of 15% on medical insurance for 2024 and 7% thereafter. Um, and all the other benefits really are a percentage of salary. Um, on your purchase service, your supplies, your capital outlay, your non-cap equipment, et cetera, um, it is a 5% increase in 2024 to mimic CPI, and then we put in 3.5% thereafter. And the long-range facility plan is fully implemented. We moved it into the capital um, projects funds, and that includes a 9.8 million bond sale. Okay. So again, this is kind of just all of what I just said, pushed out in numbers. Let's get to the, where you put it together. So when you put it together, you're gonna be looking at some massive deficits going through on 2024 through 2028, but this includes capital projects, so that's all the work that we know that you're going to be doing, so that really blows up your expenditure side. So let's flip to capital projects. That's where you're gonna see all that money, that's $14 million worth of work over the next four years. Um, you'll see at the end of 2027, that fund balance goes down to zero, that's all the work that you have planned in the long range facility plan. When you remove the construction from your total numbers, You'll see on that surplus deficit in the middle there, you're still running deficits, um, but not nearly as large as when you had the construction in there, okay? What I wanna do though is show you this. On your education fund, that's your largest fund. That's where the majority of your operations come from. That's all your salaries, your, your teachers, and you know pretty much the meat of what you do. Um, again, go to that middle row, you're in the black, you're, you're running a good ship here. Where your problem comes, and this is not unusual, you'll find this in, I would imagine, every single district in the state, is that your operation and maintenance fund is what's running in the, black, in the red. You're running at about $1.5 million in the red, and we have been for forever. The problem is that you can only, you're only allowed to levy 55 cents in the operations and maintenance fund, and it's just simply not enough to take care of your buildings. So we've been doing this for a while. That's why we occasionally will, will bring in $5 million. If you'll see in our budget for this year, there's a $5 million other financing sources. We generally move money from other funds into O&M to make sure that we can cover the cost of maintaining the facilities. So it's a little rough to see the difference, but there are two blue lines there. Um, the bottom line represents what monies you would need to have 35% of your expenses. The top blue line is how much money you would need to have 50% of your um, expenses in fund balance. The board's policy says that they want your fund balance to be somewhere between 30 and 50% of your expenditures. So in the middle of those two blue lines is your sweet spot. You'll see by the time we get to the end of this thing, the red line at the top is where we expect your fund balances to be at fiscal year end, so June 30 fund balances. The purple line in that middle there is the low point of the year. So remember, we really only take in our revenue twice a year with the two major um, property tax um, distributions, one generally in October, one generally in March. But about November, you hit your low point, and that's what that purple line is. But you're still looking at fund balances that are healthy and, and really kind of hitting that sweet spot in um, what your fund balance is or where you want your, the amount of money that you have in the bank to be. 
that you're really kind of hitting the sweet spot where we're having enough money in the bank to make sure that we can cover and we have enough in case a rainy day comes if the state starts not paying bills again, if the property taxes are delayed again. We still have enough money in bank to make payrolls and so on without having to, to take out any additional monies. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. And that's what I've got for you tonight. Questions? Can you, remind, can you remind us when the school year that the ESSER funding is done is tr after 24-25, correct? So technically it is September of 2024. So you have this school year and you have next, next school, school year. year and then like two months of run out to get you into September, because that September 24 is technically the 25 school year, but really at that point it has, it's pretty well expended. Right. So we'll have to make our decision somewhere starting in December of 23. Questions? And so, and so to piggyback off Christina's question, so even though the, the budget you just presented um, takes out those nine um, positions, it's something that we will, as a board, have to discuss and deal with whether or not that's something that we want oh, to put back in. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So let's, let's just recall here that this isn't even a budget discussion at this point. This is a five-year projection model that we put together based on what we know has happened in the past, based on what we know this year's budget is doing, and based on those assumptions that I laid out for you. We start with what this year's budget is, and then I make those changes in those assumptions that we talked about. And that's what it is moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the mini bus lease. So I'm still here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> Getting back to Midwest Transit, they no longer have new buses, so that is off the table. Um, which leads us to the two that we already have. So the three options surrounding the two that we already have is to extend the lease for two years at about $26,000 a year, extend the lease for four years um, at a cost of about $17,000 a year, or to purchase the two buses for $126,000. The life span on these buses is give or take about 12 to 15 years is what we're being told. Again, they're four years old. So if we extend the lease for four more years, we should be able to get the good life out of them. They're treated well. Um, we maintain them well. We really haven't had much problem with them. And quite frankly, one of the four years was the COVID year, so it really didn't get a whole lot of use that year. Um, so based on, on that, our recommendation right now is going to be extend this um, lease for four years, and then we'll work on getting a, two new buses. Hopefully the environment will be a little bit different and a little more hospitable. Um, but we believe that we'll be able to keep these two. Additionally, you know, looking at the difference in the cost of the leases, we don't believe that we're going to have to put that much money to work, you know, into keeping them maintained and, and fixing anything that perhaps breaks on them. So by saying that the district will then plan to purchase two new buses, we will purchase them and own them outright. That's another thing we'll have to talk about. That's going to be my recommendation moving forward is, yeah, purchase them outright okay, and hang on to them for eight years because okay. then we're not dealing with <coughs> this stuff. We're not dealing with the percentages that they want. We can get our own lease and, and you know, and, and quite honestly, we don't even have to, to finance them. You'll have the fund balances to out and out purchase them if you care to. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Don't, don't, you, look, I see you smirking over there. <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I definitely um, I'll tell you am one who, who's more and strongly in favor of purchasing um, <laughs> instead of leasing. And in just doing some, some real quick you know, um, um, research, and it's, it's come to my attention that the same company actually may have some older buses available at about $23,000. And so 
Um, I'm of the mindset, again, that maybe there's another option that what we can do is instead of buying the, the 2018s, we can buy the 2013, and then to your point, still go ahead and have buses that we, we own and can purchase the newer buses in, in four years. And so it, it's, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to, to purchasing the buses, but I also think that, that, that the leasing will not, in my opinion, get us there any sooner but it's, it's going to be a tough decision and one of the board has to make. So, I mean, I was looking at the numbers like, you know, what if we just purchase these for 126000 Well, it's still going to cost us more mm -hmm. if we're saying that in four years we're going to want to get new, new buses. Um, I'm skeptical. I'm call me crazy, but, you know, when I look at then the 2013s, you, know, you know, turning these in and buying the 2013s, I don't know who's been driving them. I don't know what kind of maintenance has been done on them. I just don't know that they're, you know, I know our two buses are in good shape. That's a comfort level for me. For, for me, and, and, and again, and I'm, I'm going to be done with this one because this, this reminds me of a conversation that you had at home. Mm -hmm. Do we buy this used car or do we buy this used car? Yep. If there's no clear answer. To both right. Perspectives. If I had a Carfax on that bus, great. <laughs> And I don't, <laughs> you know. So, yes, I, I, I respect what your position is. I'm just saying. Yeah. Hopefully there's some other options up there. Yep. Um, so that's our minibus. And you want us to vote on that tonight, right? Um, yes, yeah. please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. The next item on the agenda is the U.S. Bank Property Tax Appeal Board PTAB settlement. Yes. So we have two PTABs out there on U.S. Bank. Um, John Izzo and his team have been negotiating with U.S. Bank. Um, they have brought down, so in, initially we were looking at a loss of revenue for 2020 at about 17,000, for 2021 about 16,000. Um, they've been working with um, U.S. Bank and they have a settlement agreement that would um, Reduce 2020 down to 8,500 and about 8,000 for 2021. Um, so that would preserve about $8,500 of property tax revenue for um, 2020 and about $8,000 for 2021. So we're not asking you to take action tonight, but we are going to ask you to take action next time around and just approve that settlement agreement. We believe it to be fair. Thank you, Fran. Any questions? Thank you. Next item on the agenda are the policy updates. All right, good evening. I just have a handful of policy updates to share with you. Uh, most of the changes were minor, uh, just due to some school code changes. Um, the one to note is 4190. Courtney, can you scroll down? Thank you. The Targeted School Violence Prevention Program, that's a brand new policy. Uh, most of the contents of that policy we are already doing with building-based threat assessments when needed. Um, there's just a couple of pieces that we will have to put in place that we'll be talking about over the next um, few weeks, such as the district level team. Um, so we'll be bringing that to our cabinet discussions to put that into place and fully execute this new policy upon adoption. Any questions? Thank you. You're welcome. The next item on the agenda are the mid-year school improvement plan updates. Oops. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Is that good volume? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Welcome. I'm excited to present an update on where we're at at Western with our school improvement plan. Uh, we've been meeting as a BLT to go over all of our agenda items, and so I'm just going to kind of go through our three goals up there and kind of let you know some exciting things going on. 
So for Culture and Climate, we have done lots of collaboration and sharing this year. And the mid-year survey from Deanna Jones, the Culture Road survey we did, really came back with some positive ratings that we've seen. There were some areas that were comparable to the five essentials that we'll be taking tomorrow. And so already those kind of temperature checks showed that we have went up in the different areas we've been targeting as far as collaborating, getting out, seeing each other, the respect from students and staff. Um, we also, to help with climate and culture, aside from our items are up there, we're always doing our sharing at staff meetings, highlighting what others have been doing, how you can use it in there. And I have to give a shout out also to our instructional coach, Christina Bolenbacher. She has on our, we use a Canvas page for our staff, and it has in there the coaches corner, and she does this page called Western Avenue Sis Steal Ideas Shamelessly. So every time she's out, there's different ideas from staff members linked there. So that way, if you couldn't get out and visit, you can go and be like, oh, I remember Michael presented on that. Let me see what he was doing. And it's right there. So we've really tried to find ways to highlight what staff are doing to really boost that culture up. And then as far as our students go, one of the things we really wanted to highlight for you tonight is our monthly PAC meetings. And so at each one of these, we come together, we talk about what is our Capturing Kids Hearts focus, what's our second step focus. We do the different songs, we have different grade levels lead them, and then of course one of our exciting parts the kids always look forward to is who will be the leader of the pack for that grade level. And I've even heard students say, I'm talking to Christina so she can give me tips on how I can be the next leader of the pack. And so they really look forward to that. And we're, so we're excited about those things and keep moving those forward. As far as instruction goes, our grade levels have done a great job this year of really doing temperature checks on our SIP action items. We have broken them down into manageable chunks for everyone, and our grade level team leaders have taken them and at their weekly meetings check in, okay, where are we at? How are we doing with what we said we were going to commit to? They tag me in notes if I need something, I go back and read those. So they've really been checking in on our action items. And a couple we want to highlight tonight is one of our thoughtful classroom tools, our task rotations. We have a huge bank now. And instead of just putting kids on different apps to utilize, when they our teacher is working in small groups, the students are going and completing their task rotation. So they have four different types of learning activities they're doing. And so, for example, if they're doing some in math, they'll be doing some basic mastery math facts, and they're applying their application skills. They're working on things together, and they have two weeks to complete them. The teachers check in. Even our youngest learners, we have them linked in Seesaw slides, so they know to go in and do a mastery task. Now I'm working on an interpersonal task. So we've really developed a great bank on that. Um, our curriculum has been supporting our other activities that are on there, such as our redraw rights. Bridges lends itself very well to that. We choose one of our math problems. Let's read it, let's draw about it, and let's really go back and explain that thinking, which is where we've seen the kids really, nope, we're not just talking about it, let's write about it. So really good practice, too, for IAR. And then what we've been adding in now is some self and peer editing. So now that we have those writing responses we're working on, can you go back and check someone else's? How does yours actually sound? And we haven't really had to create anything. We've just really utilized the curriculum, but kind of dove deeper and really went through the expectations for the kids. Not just, OK, great, you did it. But how are we doing on that? And then finally, on our achievement gap, a couple of things we wanted to update you on is we've really been diving into how we're teaching those foundational skills for our youngest learners. Really kind of going back to adding in those decoding. Um, staff have also, we did a little book study at the beginning of the year, and now they've been finding podcasts to go along with it and sharing those with each other. Even my speech teacher goes, I can't wait to get your perspective on this one I've listened to, and it really talks about what we're doing. Breaking down, chunking the words again, using those Alconin boxes, and really we've switched to kind of calling some words heart words now, and flash words, and kind of teaching parents. We have some videos up on individual courses. Um, about what those words are. And so the collaboration between those staff members who have embraced that, shared what they're doing and planning their lessons, we've seen really great growth on um, our winter Ames web scores. Our PLCs are really focused conversations. I am so proud of how the staff is doing. They bring that data now. Here's exactly what we're looking at. Here's what my students did. How did yours do on that problem? And really digging into what can we do better on or what's going really well and how can we replicate that? So every other week, we've broken it down now, too, to make it more manageable. K2 meets, 
then 3-5 meets K2-3-5. So even just some structural changes that we needed to make so that our coaches and everyone can really dig into what's going on and have smaller groups to target with. And then one of the things we did adjust was our MTSS resources. We were going to put some different videos in that out. We've kind of switched to using an MTSS part of our Western Weekly that goes out in the s'more. So now the MTSS team will find different um, tidbits for parents. I have a running sheet of them. I paste them in. They're in that section there. So just little things to sprinkle in here or there. This week's was on Achieve. Last week we had some different math resources for parents. So if they're just looking for something quick, our MTSS team leads that so that we're providing those resources. So it's just a couple updates from how our school improvement plan is going. Again, we've been keeping temperature checks on it, adjusting as needed. And I'm really proud of the teams for all the hard work they've done and the fidelity that they've had this year with keeping up with our action items. Any questions? I have a, actually just a, when does the five essentials window close? Not Shameless plug. That's okay, not till March you Great, have. because I have to do that. For parents. Thanks. Make sure you take that parent survey. Yep, gonna do that. I look at this highlight time as an opportunity to see how we're moving the needle. Mm -hmm. And I heard you talk about adjustments. So in summation, are you saying that you have you think you've made all the adjustments so when we hear the end of the year, then all those all the projections that you made at the beginning of the year, you're gonna hit and you're gonna target? We're pretty confident in the adjustments that we've made to the plan. There were a couple of things on there that just we hadn't come through with yet. We were still working on getting some decodable books for our learners, but we've really committed. We tried to really zero in on the plan this year and make it attainable with the action items. So kind of what can we really do and what's our biggest bang for our buck? We really focused on those task rotations, moving more so that kids are working together during that independent time. And what we've seen from our PLC discussions and adjusting things and really digging into foundational skills, that we think these are the items that are going well. So we're keeping those moving forward. Like I said, the grade levels are really, yes, this is what's going well. Oh, that one we didn't look at as much. So really our tweaks we made with that peer editing and going now into having our upper grades really let's read it to someone. David and Christina, partner up. How was that going? Did that make sense? Those were the, some of the adjustments that we made. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Oh, you did it. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. So Sarita Hills, we're going to talk about the mid-year uh, updates for us. Um, Beth, first, beginning maybe, with climate and culture, Beth, a real focus. Microphone. Microphone. Yeah, a little Sorry bit Sorry about that. To you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No, I can't. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. It feels like it's really in my face. Um, the main thing that we've done with climate and culture, the very first thing that we really have focused very heavily on is our community connections committee. And what that committee evolved from was wanting to reconnect with our community post-COVID and get our families back in our school, re-involved, um, and highlighting the wonderful attributes that all of our families bring to our community. So with that, we've hosted some different events, such as the Back to School Bash. Um, Hispanic Heritage Night was very well attended. Um, we probably had about 150 families there, or people there with families celebrating their heritage. Um, our Veterans Day program, where we invited family members that are veterans in to tell about being a veteran, and we had a whole school assembly on that. And then lastly, this Thursday night, our Black Culture Night. We're very much doing it similarly to the Hispanic Heritage Night, where we're going to feature uh, steppers, and we're going to have our third grade students featured as the Wax Museum. So families will be able to visit different classrooms with different uh, historic African-American people and they will have a little speech prepared and you push a button and they come to life and they share their speech and then they go back to sleep like an animatronic <laughs> character from Disneyland. Um, 
After the Community Connections Committee, we are also really focusing on collaboration amongst ourselves. In our uh, weekly faculty meetings, we use the CKH strategy, name it, claim it, explain it. So the teachers bring something from their classroom, a strategy, an activity, um, uh, some kind of methodology that they've utilized. They name it, they claim it, and then they explain it and share it with the faculty, and it has been a great tool for all of us to use. Additionally, we are using bi-weekly PLCs, much, very much of what Gina just highlighted. Uh, we plan, we meet every two weeks, and at the beginning of the meeting, we are reviewing data from the previous two weeks. So we spend some time reviewing data on a formative assessment that the teachers have given. We reflect, adjust, talk about reteaching, talk about strategies, talk about methodology, talk about reteaching, anything that's necessary to support our students. And then we begin the cycle all over again. The teachers select a standard that they will focus on. They create a formative assessment that they will utilize in their classroom after instruction. And then they collect the data for the next cycle. First semester we focused on ELA, the second semester we're focusing on math. Next, going into instruction, student binders, student data binders. Teachers are meeting monthly with their students and we are collecting uh, evidence and artifacts for the students to be able to share and show their progress. The children use these at their uh, parent-teacher conferences. They were student-led. And it shows their progress over the course of the school year. Teachers collaborate with the students and talk over artifacts that they might put in the binder, the whys, the wins, evaluate their work, show growth, look at how you've grown from one month to the next, et cetera. And then for our achievement gap, Use of fluency-based programs for homework. Um, sometimes all families don't have um, everybody at home at the same time to practice homework or to have an adult assist with homework. So we've tried to really focus on independent fluency activities that the students can use, such as our popcorn reading program. Read for a few minutes every night, color it in, have a parent sign, color in a piece of popcorn, and at the end of the month we celebrate 14 pieces of popcorn and there's prizes rewarded. Additionally, then we are also doing um, math fact fluency. When you become proficient at a number in uh, an operation for addition, subtraction, et cetera, you get a certificate that's out on the wall in the hallway. And then again, our PLCs um, for achievement gap, we do track our tier two and tier three students in a data tracker for the PLC data to just monitor their progress to make sure we're making the gains necessary. Any questions? Same question um, about moving the needle. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things, and by the way, good job. Thank you. Good job. Um, one of the things that I recall from your SIP at the beginning of the year, there was <coughs> very detailed about um, projections that you were trying to uh, accomplish to move the needle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you're okay or happy with the way you are now. We, we can't measure our ELA or math goals yet because we don't do winter map, but right now we are beautifully on track for our achievement cap goal. So, again, the needle will hopefully be moved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's not hope. We're really trying to put some processes in place to make sure that we achieve that to the best of our abilities. There's been a, a bunch of news coverage recently about students that just kind of vanished during the pandemic. Like, like someone did a study last week, like on, your school in our district is the one that I worry most about that happening, where kids just left and didn't come back. Is it, does that, are you seeing any of that or everything it seems fine? Or Lack of attendance? And lack, lack of attendance of, or kids that just disappeared, never came back? Um, disappear, I don't believe we saw know. students that disappeared but we did have struggles with attendance but I think that's something similar to many of my colleagues okay so so Serena now is everyone's do we still have a problem with kids attendance or has it gotten better I guess um, this year has been a little bit difficult because we still COVID is still a reality so it is you know I, I long to go back to my big giant board that's out in front with, you know, the percentages of the attendance that day. Yeah. Um, but with illnesses as they're such and people's recovering immune systems, um, I haven't quite put, put my placard out yet. I, you, the late for school is out there, but the percentages are not looking forward to in 23, 24. 
to put that back out and we start daily announcing the attendance again. So if we put that back, if we had put it back out there, so we're lo- are you saying we're losing kids because you know someone's got a fever and then people are more sensitive to coming to school so they stay home or? Possibly, yeah. Okay. We do have more children absent this year than we did in the 1920. That's my last, you know, our last time po- right. pre-COVID. The attendance is different this year than it was in 1920, 2019 and 2020. How does it compare to last year's attendance? Uh, it's improved from last year, yes. Overall, we're plus three students year over year for Serena Hills. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hello. I'm a lot taller than Beth. Hold on. <laughs> Put that up a little higher. Um, Thank you for letting me speak at our mid-year review for Heather Hill. Um, As always, this is weird me going near the end of this this, uh, little train here. Um, But culture and climate, when we're looking at um, how we are building our relationships with our students, we are very, very focused on our capturing kids' hearts um, at our building, still doing it. We are still making sure that we're giving our kids the mid-year survey to see where we were lacking. Um, So one of the places that came up short was student voice. So we're working on that of trying to figure out how we can empower the students to feel like they have more of a voice in the school. Um, We are using our CKH themes and this month for February is kindness. So every day we are talking about kindness over the intercom, teachers have all the lessons, and then students, if they're caught being kind, they get a kindness hive ticket, which goes into a different pot. And then at the end of the month, all of the hive tickets that are the kindness tickets um, get pulled and somebody wins our kindness award, gets their picture taken, wins up, gets a prize, and they go up on the board in the office. Um, that has been a huge uh, success for us. It's, it's the first few times we did it, the little ones who did not receive, we did have tears. Um, but that, to me, I was like, it's a successful thing. They want this, so we're just going to work hard to explain how they get it. Um, the other thing that we're doing is that we are very, very avidly making sure that we meet for our monthly SEL meetings to, to go over all of our data through SWISS. Um, SWISS data gives us of our students that may have earned a referral at some point throughout the, the month. And what we do is we look at that to see if there's any children that might need to get a little bit of extra time, you know, love to where we need to put them on a check-in, check-out. Um, we look to see if there's any time frames or places throughout the school that we really want to focus in on, um, focus in on and make a goal for. Um, so right now we are working for uh, every day that we keep our hands to ourselves, we are earning a letter for Choose Kind. And then once we earn all the letters for Choose Kind, we will be having a glow stick, about 15 minute dance party with the students. So we're, right now we're working on that. Instruction wise, we're, work, we're still look going into our learning logs. Every student in the building has their own learning log. And kind of like Gina mentioned, the, the read, draw, write is what we do with the students at least once a week in either ELA or math that we really are practicing drawing out what we're, our meanings and writing about it and making sure we're explaining our thinking in those. Um, for our little grades, we are doing it even with our little ones, um, our youngest scholars, but what we're doing for there is doing a lot of modeling and doing it together. And then in about second grade, they really are starting to do it on their own to prepare them just for being able to explain their answers. The other thing that we're doing um, for instruction is our PLCs. At Heather Hill, PLCs has been every other, it has been bi-weekly like all the other schools, but has been very much just the classroom teachers led, and it was kind of up to them how, what they were doing. This year, I've worked with my reading specialist and math specialist and instructional coach and kind of ma- made them our mentor coaches, not an official title by all means, but the lead people for the PLCs. So it was really nice because I met with them for a really long couple, you know, every week for about two months, um, about a month and a half, I should say, and we kind of went through different scenarios, different formats, and came up with a new format that using our PLCs to help the teachers. So now every grade level is assigned a teacher helper to help make sure that we're moving PLCs in the right way since I can't be everywhere and, and at every meeting. And that has worked really well. The first meeting, they picked the goal from one of the power standards. They work on the formative assessment that they want to give. In the second meeting, they come back and really talk about it. And now we're just, you know, now it's just it's just like a clock. The, the, um, the cycle works perfectly right now. So it is nice having those uh, leader teachers to help with those, those 
PLCs. And then for our achievement gap, one of the things that we're doing for that is making sure we have our scheduled problem solving meetings every six weeks to where we look at our students in our tier two, tier three um, bands. And we kind of do a quick, a quick guide to see where they're at. Do we need to adjust anything? And there are times that we say, hey, we need to adjust what the student's working on. So we're not waiting till a day to day. We're not waiting um, to progress monitoring day, you know, to look at all the, see where the students are. We do make real time adjustments where needed. Um, students can come in, come out of tier two, tier three, depending. Um, students can also can come in. But that has helped really well too to make sure that as a team we are sitting down with my reading specialist and my math specialist that we sit down and do a quick look at to see if we need to move somebody further along in this in the, the levels of tier the tiers of MTSS or if we need to make an adjustment to their plan. So that is Heather Hill right now. Any questions? Yes. Yes. So um for whatever reason, I'm very proud of the Heather Hill program. I agree. And <laughs> no obvious reason. Um, and feedback of the community has said that you're doing a fantastic job. So Thank you. Thank you for that. The principal's doing a great job. Um, my question about moving the needle. So, mm -hmm. um, pre COVID, there were two schools that were moving towards, uh, the word is exemplary, that's it, right? Okay. You got it. Um, one was Heather and one was Western. So I heard you talk about um, making an adjustment to tier two and tier three. Mm -hmm. How is that needle looking in terms of possibly moving back in that direction? Well, as we know, exemplary is always a moving target. So we don't know where we need to be exactly. But we do know that we are making gains and our tier two, tier three is getting smaller. Um, one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now that we're kind of diving deep into a little bit more kind of behind the scenes is they're leaving my kindergarten like writing full sentences. They then get to first grade and it seems like something is missing. So we're trying to figure out, we were just diving deep into the data to figure out are they new students? Were they here for pre-K? Were they here for kindergarten? Um, were they, you know, we're just trying to figure those things out because we definitely see a discrepancy of where they are in K and then when they're taking their assessments in first. And that's in first, what we're doing is we have kind of rearranged how our first grade does MTSS. Um, it's pretty much like a workshop if you ever come from about 9.30 to 10.30, you're welcome to come. It's pretty much a workshop in the library of the students getting that phonemic awareness and using foundations and kind of just moving through quick little centers, all hands on deck to try and get that number down. Um, we had saw a, a good bit of the kids from tier three move to tier two, and we saw a good bit from where move from tier two move out of the tiers. Um, luckily, we didn't see a lot of students that were event first in tier one go back into tier two, tier three. However, what I'm still right now wrapping my head with my team around is why are we seeing that many kids in tier two or tier three in first grade when we're not seeing it in kindergarten? Um, so that's kind of what we're working. So are we moving the needle? Yes. Um, but I think the needle's a little shaky at times in certain grade levels, and we need to figure out what, what's, what the reason is for that. So that's what we're, we're diving deep into now. But yes, we are making gains. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. By the way, if we make it to 10 o'clock, everybody gets ice cream, right? So. <laughs> Such a tough <laughs> act to follow, but <laughs> for my colleagues. Um, good evening. Glad to be here. I am a very proud, proud <laughs> principal of Parker Junior High School. Um, I'm excited because of our teachers, our building leadership team, our professional learning communities, and just the collaboration that has been going on these most recent weeks. So as we are recalibrating our focus with our school improvement plan, I must speak very highly of our social emotional learning courses, classes, and our interventions. I heard my colleagues speak very much about tier two, tier three. One of the advantages that we have at Parker is we do have intervention coaches, intervention teachers, working with those scholars every single day, drilling down to those data points, looking at the Ames web data, looking at our other uh, assessments happening with teachers, and meeting with those scholars, small group, every single day. So that's an advantage that we have at Parker. 
We as a leadership team, we're re-energizing our teachers to not forget about the small wins. Those celebrations that happen every single day in classrooms, whether it's a gallery walk, whether it's a name it, claim it, that we do most often in our faculty meetings, so that they don't lose sight of the wins that's happening in our classrooms. So we talk about our capturing kids' hearts, positive behavior interventions, one thing that our, our scholars have done recently is review their social contracts, those things that set forth the classroom culture in the classrooms, progress monitoring. We have teacher mentors assigned to those tier two, tier three scholars, whether for academic or behavioral, to do check in, check out with those scholars every single day. So there's touch points for adults to connect with scholars so scholars can become advocates for themselves and ask the right questions. As far as what's happening in our classrooms, I visited a couple of classrooms a couple, this week, last week, weeks before. I see scholars doing oral presentations. I see scholars, um, what I like to call reciprocal teaching, where they're actually teaching a lesson and they're being coached and questioned by a colleague or a peer, so that a teacher is really standing back, facilitating that lesson. I'm seeing it in a couple of classrooms. And they're also monitoring their learning, providing that in the moment feedback to those scholars so they'll know, am I capturing the content? Am I learning the content? If I'm not, my teacher's right there to redirect me. And all that, that I just mentioned is part of our AVID program, Advancement via Individualized Determination. And so AVID, although we have one class for AVID, certain scholars are a part of that AVID program. Those AVID strategies are across all different courses and content areas. And then for our achievement gap, most recently um, our reading coaches uh, facilitated a IAR session with our teachers to review trend data previously for ELA and for math and they identify specific areas for our teachers to review collectively and de develop a game plan on how they're gonna address those particular areas. For example, our ELA teachers um, decided to visit their digital library for IAR and make sure that's an everyday practice in the bell work so our scholars are used to seeing those question stems uh, which we think will help to address that academic growth, proficiency when it comes to IER. And also our math teachers are viewing how Khan Academy, which is an online program for our scholars, can address those standards deficits every single day in the classroom. And last, I'd like to say this, uh, as a new principal here for Parker, I'm noticing here that this huge for the community involvement. So my wondering was how can we connect with the elementary school parents as we prepare for our 23-24 school year. So most recently we decided to open up for school tours. We're gonna publish that to my colleagues, elementary principals, so that we'll have designated days for the next couple of weeks for our elementary parents to come on Parker's site to actually visit classrooms, to see what's happening in the classrooms, to see what band looks like, what a sixth grade English classroom looks like, and so we're looking forward to the, that opportunity for our community. Will they do that during the school day? School yes, day? during the school day. We're gonna set up so that our NJHS scholars may be school tours, principal touring, uh, teachers available to receive our parents so they can actually see it in action. They get much worse. I think I brought some of the sunshine from Florida with me. <laughs> I bet it's going back um, so, in March. Um, one of the things that I know personally, and I think I speak on behalf of the entire world, we are always very concerned about Parker. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we want Parker to be the greatest it can be so that Parker can soar out of the back. One of those areas is absenteeism, the other is STEAM, STEM, and, and then math. Um, are we moving the needle in those areas? And if so, I'd like to have adjustments. 
Yeah, I have to agree with one of our principal colleagues that mentioned about absenteeism. We are noticing, I have a few conferences this week over absenteeism, but we are noticing different reasons. But however, I must say when we're drilling down to the specific need, um, how, can we, how can we provide those resources so there is no absenteeism? We're noticing, for example, the challenges that a family may be experiencing, so how can we make sure we're matching those adjustments for them? Whether it's um, an issue going on at home, medical reasons, and maybe they're unaware of what other resources are available to those medical reasons, so we're making sure that through our MTSS process, we're identifying who those scholars are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We will finish our mid-year school improvement plan updates in March with Flossmoor Hills. Thank you to all of uh, the building leaders that shared tonight. I appreciate all your hard work. It's exciting to see how much progress you've made in your buildings. And just thank you. Thank you for all the hard work. Yeah, we absolutely. also know how exciting it is to sit here and give that weight to that presentation. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think the best thing from my end is everything that you saw up here, we can walk into a classroom and see it. Yeah, or you can go into a teacher meeting and see it. You can see the rigor <coughs> in the plans being implemented with children and the activities that they're doing. And seeing the growth that we've seen over the last couple of months has been very impressive. I'm looking forward to that end of the year data when we get it. Uh, but certainly looking at the interim data, it's very positive as well. Very excited to welcome Jackie Janicki and Amabel Crawford. We're going to kind of walk us through our winter assessment update. I'm take the microphone off Absolutely. just because I am short. So good evening, everyone. Thank you um, for inviting me up here again to go over our winter assessments. I am bringing you our AmesWeb mid um, assessments, and we're actually presenting the data in a little bit of a different way. We're using our ECRA charts to kind of make sure that we're using uh, that picture of looking at expected growth and using that as a way of showing that data along with bringing back our triangles also. So if we could go to the next slide, or do you want me to do that? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, okay. So thinking about our ECRA, I know that um, Amabel did a great job sharing what that data looks like earlier um, this school year. So just a reminder, looking at our proficiency and our growth, knowing that that is a more equitable approach to look at student achievement, and applying our AmesWeb data to that model is what we're going to look at today. And again, when we're looking at um, those different assessments right now, we're looking at, when we look at that propensity score, we're looking at all of these combined, our MAP, AmesWeb, and our IAR. However, now we're just looking at our AmesWeb. Okay. So again, looking at student growth, you're going to see charts in just a few moments, so I broke them down so you kind of can see exactly what each of those means. So you are going to see that those student achievement growths are starting with that individual achievement. Then it goes into the future projection of that, their actual scores, and then what that growth looks like for winter is what we're focusing on today. And then all of the different um, areas looking at the colors corresponding to that high expected growth, higher than that, expected growth, lower than expected, and then unsatisfactory. Looking at the different chart headings, which you'll see in a moment too, just gives you a little overview of what each of those mean and what each of those headings mean. So this is our early numeracy and our math Ames web. So right now this is kindergarten through eighth grade. And if you can see overall, we did um, meet our affected or our, we did do our expected growth as we're going through right now, we're looking at the winter. So for kindergarten, if you can see for K through two, right now we don't have the meeting the target because we need three years of data to get there. So we don't have that for those students. But when you look at um, three through eight, you can see through each of those, the benchmark, how many students met that, how much were at high growth, expected, and then low growth. And then that effect size is looking at all of it together and if they met that effect size or not, depending on the assessment. Hopefully I'm explaining that correctly. Okay. 
What benchmark are you, when you say MET benchmark? So we're looking at the um, target in AIMSWEB along with the propensity score for all of the other assessments too. We're looking at that for that target. So I'm having trouble reconciling the, mm -hmm. but can you, it's a, you don't have to tell me right now, but can okay. you tell me how exactly you calculate gross size effect? But essentially it's zero, not statistically significant for just about every grade according mm -hmm. to this chart. Right? So I'm having trouble reconciling that if we're gross size effect is zero, we're essentially mm -hmm. as expected. But our benchmarks are falling off every year. And those mm -hmm. two stories don't make sense to me. Right? That um, I, I assume we are not thrilled with 19% of students meeting their benchmark for math in eighth grade. Right, that's, that's an area of growth, yes. Okay, so <laughs> do you see, see the issue that, that mm -hmm. you can't, we can't be saying, you can't say everyone's meeting their growth targets mm -hmm. if, we, if we have, you know, it's like we're fighting a war of attrition. We're losing kids every year in their math benchmark. So mm -hmm. can you explain? Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Why is that happening? So that is a combination, yes. yes. Three years ago, yeah. So we have two years of historical data. We're sort of building that historical background for Ames Web. So the, the numbers are, are very different. Those students in the past um, have met have met their growth targets for Ames Web, and so that's why it's showing up as based on their prior, their past performance, their propensity score is is on target. Mm -hmm. But if that continues and they continue to not meet their meet their benchmark, we're going to see a decline in the percentage of students who are meeting that propensity score or, or meeting that growth target. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that addresses my question as to why okay. growth is not tracking the benchmark, but the bigger question is, and so you know, uh, I know, Jackie, you're newer, but I've been sitting here for eight or ten years. Mm -hmm. Annabelle has as well. And mm -hmm. It's always looked like this, right, on the benchmark column, right? Every year, and it's, it's always math, right? Every year we are losing kids that are on track, and they're no longer on track. And mm -hmm. why, why? Why are we losing kids? It's happening, it's been, you know, the, the data hasn't changed in the eight or ten years I've been looking at it. Mm -hmm. What are we doing wrong? Or you know, or we're not facing the fact that whatever we're doing isn't working, because this hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a mixed bag of these are not necessarily the same students year over year, so that, that's part of it, making sure that we're capturing kids when they start with us, as well as keeping kids who have been with us on track. Uh, but that's absolutely something that we have to keep tackling, whether it's new kids or students who have been with us, um, making sure that they're meeting the benchmark consistently because that green, for example, is showing that at some point those kids were meeting the target mm -hmm. and the, the benchmark is showing that they didn't now, but historical data sort of leveled it up. Right, but that's the problem with the growth size thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the envelope stuff that well, but the problem with MAP is they said they set a growth target based on your past performance becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I performed poorly in the past, so it sets essentially a weak target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I hit my growth target, but I'm still falling behind every year. So, but that's not, I understand that that's how the data came out. My, my question is the, the, just when are we going to address the bigger picture of figuring out why this is happening? Because I've seen all very smart people slice this data a dozen different ways mm -hmm. and the end result has never changed. That we are losing kids at what we're setting for our benchmark for math. Mm -hmm. I assume benchmark here for math is something like eighth grade algebra? Right, so it's a national, when you look at the Ames web, they're looking at a norm reference of all the students in the United States that take Ames web. So that's the Ames web component. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at the benchmark, as far as looking at it as the ECRA data, they're also including the map, I'm assuming, into that score also. Yeah, all the assessments, it's yeah, only it's only Ames web, okay. Mm -hmm. a look at those foundational 
you know, that's exactly what uh, our schools are talking about when, when we're trying to address is within this data. Mm -hmm. But the, so the reason why the effect size looks positive is because the expected growth is still high. But you're looking at attainment, like they're mm -hmm. not getting to where they need to go, regardless of how much they're growing, right? Is that what you're... Well, they're not growing. So it, it, the problem is you're setting expected growth right. probably too low, and that's why it looks okay. But, but for what this is, they, they are growing, right? They sure. are moving, but they're not getting to where they need to be based on what the expected, what we want, we want the benchmarks, to, we want the percentage meeting the benchmark to go up. Right. So that's your, yeah. Accelerating their growth. Right. Even past what right. the green indicates. Yeah. Because really the green means they're on track. Mm -hmm. And to Kim's point, yeah. when we're seeing students who started off behind track, we have to keep pushing them to they're moving. past just what their expected outcome is Cam, there are two unrelated categories. I know. Yeah. The, yeah. The attainment yeah. is strictly attainment, and the other one is comparing your own growth from one year to the next right. and not anything other I know. than. Okay. So, so, but here's the problem. So I, have, I won't name them. I have a set of cousins who all they did is play football and watch TV. Every one of them is like a doctor and actuary, right? Like, what, like we wanted to, we used to joke that, that, that if we had their TV, then we would be smarter, right? But that's Microphone. the. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the, kids are going to make growth. I, you know, not, not that you're not all doing wonderful jobs, but you could, you know, have movie day every day, and weirdly, some kids would grow. So, so the, the growth targets aren't, they're not getting set right, and they're not high enough, because you've got 55% of your students meeting a benchmark in math in third grade. You lose 20% of those students the next year, and yet you're saying, or, you know, on average, your students met their growth targets. That can't be right. It, it, it's right. It's because you look at it's, high growth and then expected. The gro then the growth target is set wrong. The growth target is driven by your previous year's performance. I know. So as long as you wrong. grow the same amount that you did in years past, you're said to have met your growth target. Not in terms of attainment, but strictly in a comparison of your growth one year to the next. I understand that. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that's fundamentally wrong. It makes no sense. No sense. Our goal is to get, what, 50, 80% of our kids At least. down to that. And so if we're just setting our growth targets by how the kids did in the prior years, without reference to where we want them to end up, it will, it will always look like this. If we're, we're not being realistic with the kids, okay, eight points of growth is good enough this year. Because realistically, to stay on, the, to hang, stay on this chart, they need 10 or 15. I think in a perfect world, most of these are green and blue, right? Mm -hmm. Getting to your point. I mean, we're looking for growth that outpaces one annual year. The question is, what's, what's a reasonable amount of growth given the constraints of the school day. So I think as you're, as you're talking about unpacking the work, it's what is that rigor at fourth, fifth, and sixth, right? Is it looking at the pacing of the math, the organization of the different lessons, the content, the type of complexity as we are moving kids? Because I know that we've talked about this a number of times, certainly at this table. We've talked about that decrease as students get to Parker. Right? The data goes down, right? And so as we do have conversations about math classes and class programming, this is exactly where, to, where kind of the rubber meets the road. The green dots are helpful to know that, yes, those students have held serve from where they were in the past. <coughs> the next step of this is where you can see classes, lists, <coughs> names, et cetera, and then you can have that other conversation about, okay, how much growth do you need to make so that you are accelerating and catching up to where you where we want you to be. Realistically, it's no more than a year and a third. But a year is a benchmark, period. That, that is the base level expectation. Accelerated growth from there is really what we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. my, my question to, to, to Cam's point is, I guess, for me, it's a simple question. Causality, what lever needs to be pushed to bring about a change. 
And I'm always listening for that answer, and I never really hear that answer. I, I, I continue to hear the, the problem, the symptoms, but I never hear what is the solution. Well, there's 2,003 different mm -hmm. lovers. Right. Right? Truthfully. Okay. I'm telling you. So you're saying and it's all the students. The students are the... the no, but if you're asking for the lever, yours is different than Christina's, mm -hmm. is different than mine. And so we, we tend to want to reduce this conversation to a, a speed of widget making in a number of cases. It just doesn't work that way. And so as the principals talked about the professional learning communities, what that means is they're sitting around a table, they're bringing different student artifacts, they're comparing those artifacts, identifying what worked in this class com compared to this one, compared to this one, taking those best strategies back <coughs> and reteaching and reworking, et cetera. Right. That's, that's the scalable work, but you could see it's based on individual needs. I think that's where as we lean into the individualized learning experiences, as we get better with tracking the student's data, tracking those interventions, it was, you know, as we see as we have this conversation, we get into the special groups. This data will help us make us help us make decisions on staffing pieces, right? With SR three, that's what we've talked about, and so that will come out later in this data. Um, I don't know that it's reasonable to expect that if we do A, then we will see B. Realistically, with regards to math instruction, it is a problem that exists in our country for a long time, and it's perpetuated because we, as a a large group has not made the necessary shifts in terms of math instruction. When you talk about math instruction, there's essentially three components that you want to be in touch with. One is procedural fluency, one is conceptual understanding, and lastly, the application of concepts. Typically, most classrooms in our country focus probably 75% of their time on procedural fluency. There needs to be a better balance between procedural fluency, conceptual understanding, and the application of those concepts. That's the key to seeing a change in those scores. And, and that is a lengthy process that has to be very intentional and well supported from start to finish. You said procedural? Procedural fluency, conceptual understanding, and That's the application conceptual. of those concepts. Mm. Okay. So yeah. So our our so there are students who could potentially need two years growth in one year, right? So this just to what you're saying, Cam. There, mm -hmm. that's a lot, right? Like that's asked, that's a lot. That's the that's the constant challenge. I'm the thing that I'm thinking about and wondering about is where does that happen if they don't start that way? Like if they start in K one two, they're fine. I I continue to be worried about the drop off. That's because at some point they are not a year behind. They're not a year and a half behind. They're not two years behind. They're on track or really close, mm -hmm. and they slowly and then dramatically fall off of that off track. And that's the part that I I really would love to have a greater understanding. How where is that cliff? Mm -hmm. And how much of it is related to their foundation, which Michael spoke to, and how much of how much of it is it related to the kid themselves and their own Boy, however when it's gonna kick in, mm -hmm. it might not kick in before they leave us. Mm -hmm. Like how what are those different pieces? I'd mm -hmm. love to have a greater understanding of that. I, I worry that the predominant prompt reason we see this year after year is it has yeah, I worry that the reason we, don't, we see this every year is that the problem is a significant part at home. No one's telling them, no, really, dude, you've got to, this is the bare minimum. Or, or we're not effectively communicating that to parents or, because I, I, you know, I can't imagine, uh, I, I, well, I really, I cannot, I don't understand how I don't understand what the parents in the other 80% in math are doing. I, I don't mean that as an attack on them, right? But I would be, like I would have ulcers if I was in that group, right? With, and so I don't, I don't know what the disconnect is. But I, I don't really believe the 20% of our students are, are, are like innately this, 
that it's this hard for them. And I would very gently challenge the idea that two years of growth in a year, <coughs> so we keep looking at it like it's a huge task. It is. But we see, how many students do we see that do that? that do, I mean, we have like 20, 30, 40 students. We have students that do it. Another of the high performing students, right? But they, but they make it look easy. And somehow we're not translating that down to the other 80%. And we, we, we have to find a way yeah. to get those mm -hmm. kids that are a year or two behind caught up. It, 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 I don't, you know, I, it's, it's a subject which constantly frustrates me because I feel like it, once those kids leave eighth grade, they're on a track that they can't, because in high school, making up a year of math is virtually impossible. Yeah. It's a, it, it, it All of what you said is accurate if we use the same approaches that we've used for the past 50 years. If we keep doing more of the same, we're going to get the same result. You can't change your outcomes by doing the same practices. There has to be a shift in instructional practices, and that shift is necessitated that we have a more balanced approach in terms of the way math instruction is delivered. If you look at the experts across the country, Joe Bowler being one of the leading uh, experts, that's the conversation. If you look at all of the secondary math experts, David Foster who leads the Silicon Valley Math Initiative, the conversation is the same over and over again. We have to have a more balanced approach to the way we deliver instruction in the math classroom. Focusing on procedural fluency is an important part, but it can't be the dominant part of math instruction. And as long as it is, we'll get the results that we have. I think one tool that we have now that we didn't have before, frankly, are the scatter plots. Because we can identify by program, we can identify by individual student who have outpaced their growth target, where they landed, and then kind of drill back from there. What were their experiences? Because I think. That's one of the, you know, we could identify maybe those 20 kids in the past, but now we, now we know it's not a guessing game. And so we can absolutely bring these pieces back. Dana, how do we take what Michael is saying and put that into practice? Because I don't do math, right? I have struggled, and it is the, the reason that I believe in public education, because I went to private. And for years, I struggled. So I wanted my students to be in public education to where they could receive services if need be. Um, thankfully, they haven't had to, or I'm a teacher. I supplement for them at home. Sure. But if he's got a point, and if we need to be listening to his point, how do we do that? You revise your curriculum and those experiences. Yes, I love and I could just add also, mm -hmm. I think that's true because I had my fifth grader teach me an algorithm that I had never learned. And her way of division made more sense than my long division that I learned however many years ago it was. So I'm applauding any, you know, the curriculum is, seems great, but I think as an adult looking back at this now, what Michael just said makes sense. So I just want to make sure that we're connecting those dots. All right. 
So looking at our reading scores, same kind of conversation, I'm sure, as we go through um, that area, and looking at our K through eight, again, looking at all the different levels of growth and where we are in relation to that. Then looking at our, um, our student groups, so seeing uh, normally we did look at breaking out in our Ames web charts, each of the groups, but we did look at it more as a holistic way using the ECRA data um, to kind of see where we are in that. And again, drilling down, as we said, especially when looking at the IEP students, where are those students that are not making that ex expected growth? You know, what are we doing? What interventions need to change? What things do we need to put in place? And the, the buildings are most definitely having those conversations and um, working through when we look at those students especially. Okay. All right. And then this is our reading of those student groups. So that was math, sorry. And there is our reading. <clears throat> so in this area, again, looking at the different um, groups of students, seeing where their expected growth was, um, how many met that benchmark, and then um, their growth size also. And then we did break them out into smaller groups. I know that the board has brought up before seeing um, what these certain programs that students were in, what their growth looks like specifically. So we did um, bring that out through the math interventionists, students that are getting that intervention, the summer academy students, and then students that are in athletics. And then we also did um, summer academy, and then we also did six through eight participating. That's a good break. That's math, and then so, looking at literacy. For sure. So from what I'm looking at, does that, it appears, and I'm, I'm, I want to just ask for confirmation, that the summer academy program did help. Or am I not looking at that properly? It helped. Mm -hmm. it certainly yes. shows that those mm -hmm. students are on track with their, their, their growth. Um, we want to, just going back to similar conversations we just had, we mm -hmm. want to see that in blue. We want to, right. summer academy is a program that is designed to help purpose of it is to help accelerate growth past the standard school year. Uh, so we want to keep pushing that and dig deeper into what we can do during a short amount of time during summer academy to accelerate that growth. So, okay, and then oh, with, back, sorry. when it comes to, I just want to make sure I'm reading. So mm -hmm. with the athletic activities, this is only at Parker. Right, this is the math. 583 slide. students right. were not in athletics, 147 were, but the difference is minimal between the two groups. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay, then going back to the way that we have looked at um, our Ames web charts in the past, kind of looking at it as a district, Seeing again the green meaning low risk, meaning they are on target to meeting the expectations. And then the moderate risk, meaning there is some, you know, there are some concerns, um, not quite on track, but you definitely can get there. And then the red are the high risk students, the students that we are concerned about the most. Looking at the first um, set of charts is looking at math. So in our kindergarten, you can see there is a nice movement through that. Um, adding more students to tier one, less to tier three is what we always wanna see um, in relation to that. The same for tier one, I'm sorry, the same for grade one with early numeracy. Looking at that percentage of students and more students moving. Remember that the apprentices is the actual number or the percentage and um, the number in front of that is the amount of students. Grade two, again, nice movement through. And then third grade, um, more students in green. Same for um, grade five. And then six, again, as we go into, um, more into the junior high, we do see that it is comparable to our ECRA data too. Uh, that we are, there are less students in each of those moving through. So that is, again, a focus. And Parker, as Amabel said, is working very hard to address that through our math interventions, as Ursula shared, um, addressing those gaps. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Might go back. Go back to fifth to six. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm talking about mm -hmm. So those numbers look good, question mark, question mark. 
and then you go to sixth grade, mm -hmm. boop, what happened? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I got to do it again. What happened? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm curious. What, what happened? Right, right. There's, so there's a change in expectations. There's a change mm -hmm. in complexity. There's a change in student. Mm -hmm. These are not the same students either, right? So mm -hmm. what, would, what would be helpful to see is for these sixth grade math students, their fifth grade 2022 scores, because they're different. So then that we can at least see where they were in fifth grade, where they end up in sixth grade. So we can, we can follow up with that. Yeah, I can do the cohort again. I can bring that chart back. I, I had a question about sure. how do we, uh, I know that some of our, not some, um, well, yes, we have a, a chunk of students who are in accelerated classes, some being at HF. How do they fit in to be tested through Ames Web? Does the program itself move with them at their level? Is that how that works? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, do they take those? Uh, yeah. All mm -hmm. are right. Uh, Okay. 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 And then moving through to our reading reports. Um, again, looking at positive uh, direction for some of those charts, definitely. And um, moving through really all of the grade levels. All the way um, up to, we look at again, um, fourth grade there, we definitely do need to drill down a little bit there and kind of see um, a little less we didn't get too much moving in our tier three, so I know the buildings are working. We go to our next steps. Looking at exactly what those reading interventions are, we've added a lot of different interventions that and teachers have been trained um, on a lot of great um, programs and they're implementing those, so kind of looking at that fourth grade level. But again, this is district-wide, so the building data may look different depending on the fourth grade. It may be high or low depending on you know, where those students are coming from. And then um, looking at fifth grade reading, and then um, again, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, kind of similar to what we saw in ECRA. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Wait, let's go back. That got, hold on a second. I, I know the reason mm -hmm. I'm asking about this question is because the ESSER funds are about to fall off at some point. Mm -hmm. and Do you want me to make some decisions? Go back to um, the effectiveness of some of the interventions, mm -hmm. and so I'm really trying to see if there's a pattern, some correlations to help me with some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. Just talking out loud. Mm -hmm. So definitely at the middle school, we do have to dig deeper into some of those interventions, and we we are. I mean, we are doing that, but it is a process. It's a challenging with the schedule to there and trying to make sure that. Students are getting interventions um, in each of the areas that, that they need support in. So sometimes that doesn't, it happens, but it happens in a different way. It might be more of the classroom teacher doing the interventions um, instead of being pulled out. So those are things that we do have to really um, drill down to, especially at the middle school level. Is this, is this mm -hmm. year two of interventions? Or your, what you count as year one of interventions? Three. For the math interventionists? Yes. Year two. Year two. Mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. Um, and then kind of pulling it all together and looking at, um, again, just an assessment summary of what we kind of talked about and then what our next steps are. So we're continuing, as all the principals shared today, focusing on that small group instruction, also making sure that we are responding to that data and identifying where those needs are and targeting those students to meet those expectations. Also, we have um, done a very great job at getting more of our day-to-days focusing on those instructional changes, actually having those meetings and having those MTSS meetings and doing a lot of our individual problem-solving meetings too to address those students. So those are all of our steps that we are um, moving forward with. The, this what? eighth grade group is the group that started in remote. They started middle, middle right. school mm -hmm. At home, yeah, right? yes, mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. them. What are we doing with? So I'm just noticing two things. I mean, one, we we have the spring data, and so you'll bring that to us. Mm -hmm. um, 
later in the spring, but there is some deep concerns about sending eighth graders on to high school with, like, I mean, they're clearly, it's, it's really, it's decreasing pretty significantly. And if you look at the seventh grade, we're on a similar pathway going down. Um, and, you know, there's some things to take into account. Winter sometimes is the dipping and then it goes back up. Yeah, that's true. But if it does continue to go down, I mean, we can do something about seventh grade, but it, I, I am a little concerned about the transition of the eighth graders to a high school experience without counseling them on, like, the, these are such big gaps that, you know, it makes me wonder about their ninth grade year. Like, how will they be set up for, um, like, how are we preparing families to go and make that transition effectively, given that their children, you know, almost half are potentially in a, a space of recovery? Uh, I know. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. That makes sense. I could see like a small population. I mean, Summer Academy is limited as well. So I'm, I'm, I, I say this, uh, you know, like, I know that you guys are, have repeatedly shown us about the interventions, but given the, it's just the size is, is pretty problematic. We're not even talking like a little Christmas tree, like a top. We're talking, there's a good number of yellow and red there, so. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jackie. I lost where we are. School calendar. Calendar. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is the school calendar. I, I just wanted to say, so I, I hope you hear from the board that we appreciate and acknowledge and see <coughs> the work that's happening and that we just want to be a part of the solution and supporting you in any way that we can it with um, our, our thought sharing, but, but more than anything, we're grateful for the work that you're doing and we can see that you're doing work and we know that it's an impact, but we're worried about our students, we're worried about our children. So just if you, you hear that from us, it's our genuine concern to make sure that every student gets what they need so that they can be successful and so that they can meet their targets and they can grow and they are able to be successful. That's, that's what you, I hope that's what you're hearing from us. Absolutely. Okay, next item on the agenda, the school calendar revision. Yes, we approved our <laughs> school calendar and we were notified uh, that there was a revision at the high school and this represents their new dates. Uh, do not, I would say at this point, I don't think that there is alignment between any of the three school districts, uh, 153, 161, or 233. This will make a step into, depending on what we do here, bringing us back into alignment uh, with the high school. I've expressed my uh, concern with Dr. Wakeley, and I think he understands some of the challenges that this move uh, puts not only on our parents, but on our students. So the consequence here is, uh, you can see our dates, we have institute on 16th, 17th, and 18th, and students would start on the 21st. The proposed dates uh, that the high school will discuss would have institute days on the 14th and 15th with students starting on the 16th. Uh, in actuality, for our kids, we have 7th and 8th grade kids who will take classes at the high school that if we don't start with them, what we've run into in the past is an equity issue on who can get to school and who can't. And then just thinking about our families in general, since we are just such a close-knit community, uh, we do have siblings who attend the high school uh, who do provide either you know, uh, family support, et cetera, at home for the ele elementary siblings, and that would be gone as well. So really, we're just looking for feedback here. Uh, as long as the response is positive, we will adjust our calendar, make at least the start dates match, and then bring that back for action on 
in our March action meeting, business ha meeting. Have you spoken with HF about what if we left our calendar that way and the students that are taking classes at HF just wouldn't start until then? And I mean, hi, don't start your instruction until we get there on the 21st, right? <clears throat> Obviously, that can't happen. But right. I mean, the reason, okay. Uh, so the reason that we're go they're going back to this calendar is the reason that we went to this calendar originally is because you cannot forget fit the first semester in before winter break if you don't start this week of August. And so I firmly expect that they will start instruction the first Immediately. day. Immediately. So this is their way of saying we were right? It doesn't sound like I mean, it's a roundabout. <laughs> it doesn't feel it's a roundabout <laughs> way. Roundabout way. I have no objection to object to, to adjusting our calendar to match the high schools. So for clarification, so the dates that you got down here to prove Mm -hmm. for 161, and the date you have down here for HF, you're saying you, they're going to line up? Because right now they're... So they were identical. Okay, and now they're not. Correct. But we've already approved ours, so ours didn't change. Okay. So, we were. so our, our commitment to the community is that we'll work with not only Homewood 153, but District, two, District 233 as well. We've got to share those sample dates. We all meet with our different... Um, teacher associations, we meet with our board, we all come to agreement, but we know, hey, we're gonna start here, you know, an institute day or so may be off, but generally speaking, that first day for students, winter break, spring break, those are identical. After we had those conversations, as uh, HF continued to work, they adjusted after we had already approved ours. Are you going so. to have enough time in the 14th and 15th to get everything that you would have done because since you're losing a teacher institute day? Maybe. We'll make it work. So, so we'll make it you, work. When you bring this back, it's going to look, it's going to look a little different than this. Yeah. It's going to look more like HS. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> but yes, it, losing that institute day is an issue. Now, Where do you, you put that? Oh, we just push it into the year, which is, isn't the worst thing either as well. Because you know, if we are short on one resource consistently in education, it's time. And so being able to space those institute days out a little bit could buy us a little bit additional training time, whether it is to focus on uh, math, ELA, social emotional learning, et cetera. Uh, but we can hit multiple um, topics multiple times throughout the year, increasing the effectiveness of that training. Are we aligned on all the other days as well for HF? We'll have, we'll have to go back and double check. And I ask that because of Chris's point around the start dates. The 16th is a Wednesday, which means that the first period doesn't even exist on that day. So really, they're only missing the 17th and 18th. And what I've experienced uh, personally around the days in which we have off because of an institute day uh, versus Parker, I mean, sorry, HF, is that if, if the cost is just two days, it almost feels like, why change it? I mean, so like... Um, you know, if there's a lot of other days that yes, then that means like, yeah, we should probably mitigate it and choose to start on the same day and have the 17 and 18. But like, honestly, down the road, if there's several institute days and they have to go on their own anyway to HF, sure. it starts to become like, it's the same thing. Like, they yeah, have we'll, to show. We'll double check. Thank you. Oh, I, I was going to ask, if we do change it, and there are families that already made vacation plans, I don't know, maybe just so that building principals would be aware of that, if, sure. uh, if that, that had, catches some people. Okay. Okay, the next, so th that's the end of the um, discussion items, and now we move into action items. <laughs> And the first uh, action item, uh, I, I, action item A, bills for the month of February. I have reviewed the bills for the month of February um, in the amount of $846,418.40. I have um, asked questions of Fran, and um, I'd like to ask Need a second? Second. So, second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Yes.
Yes. Correct. Yes, and the motion passes. Uh, let's see, may I have a motion to approve an extended four-year lease for the 228 passenger buses currently utilized by the district at a cost of $17,138 per year? So moved. Second. Roll call. Nelson? Yes. 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 No. Yes. Yes. Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the purchase of four rooftop units from Train US Incorporated at a cost of $94,692? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Rouse? Yes. Trump? Yes. Lanier? No. Blackman? Yes. Lee Yes. Nelson? Yes. Trace. Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to not approve the resignation of the personnel listed in personnel report 23-012 for failure to provide the board 30 days of notice of resignation during the school year. So moved. Second. Roll call please. Yes. Nelson. Yes. Lanier. Yes. 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 Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the general leave of absence for employee DA89028 from January 12th, 2024 until January 22nd, 2024. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Lanier? Yes. Rouse? Yes. Tron? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Leafstrom? Yes. Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the general leave of absence for employee KU05093 from August 16th, 2023 until December 8th, 2023? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Nelson? Yes. 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 Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the expulsion recommendation for student 2023D-15? So moved. <coughs> Second. Roll call, please. Lanier? Yes. Rouse? Yes. Tron? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Leafstrom? Yes. Trace. Yes, and the motion passes. Next two items are the information items. I think we wanted to add something to the, yes. not, oh no, not to March. We're going to add it to April, residency. I'll let you. Oh, we can still add it. This is just a, this is a minimum. Okay. All right. Good. Yes. All right. I think we have a couple of topics. Okay. I'm sorry. I think we have a couple of topics that we may want to bring oh, back. Perfect. For the cow in March. Okay. Any other questions regarding the information items? Okay. We do not need executive session, correct? correct. May, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 